Good morning. Good look out. Good morning. Hey! It's a very bright sunny day. My car is covered with dust from the Sahara. I don't know why there isn't sand everywhere, because if you think about it, the dust is always coming up from the Sahara. Every year we get dust from the Sahara. So far as I know, we don't send any sand back to the Sahara. It's all a one-way trade. So we should be covered in sand by now. But no, for some reason, someone is selling sand to the Sahara and keeping it secret. Right, probably that Liz Truss. <laughs> Business secretary, knows no bounds, going about what she is. She's bounding around the world, signing trade deals with everybody now that we've left the European Union. I think uh, Japan is the latest one. So uh, I'm, I'm pretty uh, positive about everything, trade-wise. Now, a bit of housekeeping. My uh, car cam that uh, records the, uh, you know, the forward-facing car cam. I uh, downloaded a few uh, podcasts and then went to find the uh, car cam footage and found out that uh, some of it had been lost. Now, I think some of it was lost because I was in the red car and it was never recorded. And I think some of it was lost because I waited like seven days to get it and it, the card I've got in there can't hold seven days and so it deleted some of the earlier files. So if you've been watching some and the car cam footage has been missing and obviously you've been concerned, we've had thousands of letters about it and hundreds of phone calls and one fax. Uh, but don't worry, uh, I'm going to download the car cam footage sooner. It's just a case of uh, me thinking, you know, I've got bags of time to do everything. That's a weird little car, wasn't it? <coughs> now let's get my coughing out of the way, so I get my voice working. I'll do this in my stage voice. You don't, uh, you probably don't realise, but I don't talk to people at this level in the car normally. It's all, uh, it's all to try and uh, cut down on the increase the uh, signal to noise ratio. So, a bit of a sad story, really. I don't even remember that seven-year-old I was telling you about. He came in, had his mother insisted he was screaming with toothache all night, every night, and uh, she wanted something done, so uh, we, uh, I uh, sort of got to know him a bit, you know, established a bit, a bit of rapport, put a temporary filling in without doing any drilling, just some zinc oxide eugenol. She then says the temporary filling fell, fell straight out, although she didn't mention it. She brought him in the next day because she said the problem was not, you know, hadn't significantly improved and uh, he's still shouting with pain. Although every time he came in to see me, he looked like a, you know, cherubic little boy, happy, not at all screaming in pain. Not that I didn't believe her, but I mean, you know, I'm just saying. Sometimes patients exaggerate. While we're on the topic, actually, if you want a good tip as to find out whether patients are exaggerating about the pain, then just uh, you invite them to exaggerate, and they all will take the trap. So, for example, they come, oh, Mr. Watson, I'm in so much pain, I'm in so much pain. And then uh, just say to them, you know, how bad is the pain? On a scale of 0 to 10 where 10 is being attached to four horses and having all your arms and legs ripped off and, and zero is, 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 you know, is happily floating on a cloud. How about it? Oh, it's, it's 11, Mr. Watson, it's 11. And, you know, and then, you know, it's tempting to say, really, it's worse than having all your arms and legs ripped off. But don't say that because they've already fallen into the trap, you know. They've already said that they're not in the realm of... Uh, scientific determinism they're in the realm of um, hyperbole and what they're saying is in the most part hyperbolic and so that's you know 
and then and then <clears throat> the next time they come in and you say how is the pain oh it's still 11 still 11 you say well it's not any worse then you know the pain scale is a very good idea it's a good tool in the, in the management of pain um, if only because you know someone will come in and say you know that feeling you did it's you know I've been having to take painkillers and uh, it's uh, it, it hasn't settled down you know, and it's two weeks now and and you say to them, well, on a scale of 0 to 10, blah, 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 horses, horses, how bad is it? And they go, oh, it's about a 2. It's about a 2. And you go, really? It's about a 2, is it? You know, you know, if it's only about a 2, do you think you could possibly, you know, give it another week or so to settle down, you know, before I take this tooth out? Oh, dear. So anyway, poor little seven-year-old, who I will call Fred, he, um, so I gave him some antibiotics and uh, we had to uh, give, give him some uh, 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 sugar-free syrup or something and then which we delivered to his house and everything and didn't charge him anything, didn't charge him anything for the visits, didn't charge him even anything. We absorbed the four pound cost of the antibiotics. Anyway, uh, but his mother was in, insistent on something being done. And so, so much so that when she came back to see me for the second time, uh, where, where we prescribed the antibiotics, she said, "Oh, you know, can't you do, can't you do a filling? Can't you start the filling now? You know, uh, can't you put another temporary filling in?" And I said, "No, this tooth is going to be hypersensitive. If he's screaming as much as you say, then and he's got some sort of acute, you know, I was thinking periostitic sort of uh, infection, incipient infection, then." Uh, yeah, really, the last thing I want to be doing is, and it was going really swimmingly at that point. You know, he had two visits to the dentist. We were getting along really well. He was, not, he was asking me questions. We was chatting to each other and everything, and building up a relationship. And then, so then, uh, I didn't ring the next day, but I rang the morning of the day after that, and I just said to her, like, "How is he? How, you know, how is he getting on?" Because I was, I was genuinely interested. You know, I was really wanted her because we hadn't heard from it <clears throat> and I was sure that if he'd been up screaming for a third night in the row she would have rung me up again but apparently she didn't she said that what had happened was her husband had decided that he needed to see another dentist and uh, so they'd taken him to see another dentist who pronounced that these two teeth the decayed upper left D and E or more likely just the, the E needed to come out and had proceeded to um I convinced the father to get the child numb and then proceeded to uh, make a, a complete abortion of the extraction to the point where the boy was so distressed and the tooth was so, uh, uh, you know, was not properly anaesthetized to the point where, the, uh, where they aborted the extraction and decided not to do it. And the dentist, in, in, you know, in a cowardly, in a cowardly move, in my opinion, then said, oh, no, uh, it's a specialist job. He needs to see a specialist. I'll refer him to a specialist, uh, a children's dentist, and the children's dentist will be able to handle him. As though, as though this child was like a wild animal and he was unmanageable and he, and he couldn't be dealt with in general practice. And that uh, he, he required, uh, you know, and I, I should imagine what's going to happen is he's going to end up having a GA and having a general clearance of uh, all his all these decayed baby teeth. And he's going to be one of these, um, he's going to just turn into one of these statistics where, um, you know, they're, they're every now and then somebody stands up in Parliament or, or a bunch of dentists write to the Telegraph and say, what a massive increase in the amount of... Uh, children's extractions under general anaesthetic therapy and uh, one of them will be my boy Fred who could could quite easily have uh, had a pulpotomy at my practice under local and uh, lived happily ever after but uh, you know uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm pleased his mother didn't ask me what what to do because um my advice to her probably would have been to put him up for adoption in the hope that he actually, his next set of parents, he's not as stupid as the first set of parents. Because there, there's multiple mistakes there made by, in the, you know, 
it by both sides. For the mother's mistake was feeding him on sweets and, and crisps because that's all he said he would eat, right? So there's there's a massive mistake. But then having said that, you know, she saw him in pain and I think she realised the, the folly of her dietary planning and really obviously cared about him and was prepared to turn over a new leaf and, and because it was all baby teeth he probably would have had perfect adult teeth anyway um, uh, but then for some some reason she then her faults were the diet and her insistence that something should be done you know something with a capital S uh, something must be done all the time she want he's in pain therefore some some physical positive action needs to be taken whereas in fact sometimes uh, time is the best thing just let time pass you know put him on antibiotics get him through the next 48 hours and then everything will settle down and of course we know that because we've seen it many times but obviously I appreciate the patients don't know that but they want an instant fix and if they want an instant fix in a situation where no instant fix exists then they are going to end up with a, an abortion of an extraction which is what uh, they ended up with and I'm sure that was um, due to the, the mother didn't say to what extent she tended to blame her husband and say no my husband took over the whole project and decided to take him to another dentist um, and so you know but I'm sure I'm sure that uh, in the same way as that she'd been saying to me can't you do this can't you do that can't you do this you know this sort of attempt to try and micromanage everything um, she was probably the same with the husband you know you can't leave him like this I've taken him to this dentist he won't do anything all he's done is given him antibiotics he won't even do another temporary filling he won't do a filling he won't do an extraction he obviously needs some treatment you know very sort of treatment approach uh, adopted approach now perhaps perhaps I'm uh, maligning her and I'm perhaps she uh, perhaps she said no you know we found a lovely dentist and I like him and he seems to know what he's doing and you know he has explained it all to me but the husband said no don't be ridiculous he needs to have that tooth out and, and I'll, I'll suppose I'll have to organise it you know you just don't know what's gone on there the father is uh Again, you know, I mean, may well be thinking he's acting in the best interests of the child, but not, you know, as it turns out, obviously found out that really that, that he wasn't, you know. What the father's done is introduced him to some old-fashioned, probably state-sponsored dentist who's, who's done what we all know is the worst thing possible for that child, which is put him through a horrendous experience uh, more than sufficient to deter him from seeing dentists for the rest of his life and if he goes to a dentist before he's 35 once his parents stop taking him I'll be amazed because it's just you know and that's the problem is he, he can have 10 good experiences with me and one horrendous experience with someone else and he will be put off it only takes one experience to put a child off and um, whenever you get adults in who say uh, no, I don't like going to the dentist. They always got this one, and it's always only one story about how somebody grievously assaulted them without any regard at all to their uh, consent or, or uh, pain threshold or feelings or whatever. And that was his, wasn't it? That was his. And then, and then you've got a dentist. Who, who sees a child come in with a mother or a father or father and mother saying that he's uh, in severe pain or has been in severe pain and he's got a decayed, an extensively decayed tooth and the dentist just just look at it and thought I'll get that numb and take it out and it's you know it's not going to be the easiest job I'll do today but it is a, I'm a dentist and it's a job, you know, this is the job. Taking teeth out of, gammy teeth out of children. And that dentist, who I do not have much respect for, I've got to say that, has um, 
I know, I mean, you wouldn't really expect them to liaise with me. I mean, a phone call would have been a nice thing. But no, they, they've just, um, they've just decided to, on the first visit, right, on the very first visit, having built up no rapport with the child whatsoever, have decided to uh, try and do a, um, inject the child into a hypersensitive tooth and probably not, not been able to do a palatal injection, which would have been necessary, in my opinion, to have extracted that tooth. And, um, and bearing in mind, he's seven. So we're not talking about um, a child whose roots are uh, in any way less than fully developed on, on, a, on an E. I mean, this is going to be this is going to be well and truly anchored in. And has tried to extract this tooth. I don't know whether he got to the point of putting the forceps on it, but if he did, that would only have made the things worse because then you, you've ended up with a traumatised and semi-extracted tooth. A hysterical child, and I would imagine a hysterical mother, because by the time I rang her, which I think was the day after she'd had it done, um, she was in tears telling me that, uh, uh, telling me what had happened. She was sort of, she was telling me, she told me that they'd taken the child to see another dentist. She told me that the dentist had tried to extract the tooth. And <clears throat> just the action of <clears throat> describing to me what had happened to the boy since he'd left my surgery um, caused her to, her to cry. So, you know, and I, and I, you know, I mean, it's too much to expect her to say, uh, it, my, my husband had a dumb idea. I wish we hadn't done it. They, they'll never say that. But I mean, she knows, she knows that I think that, and I know she knows. So that's enough, isn't it? And in the end, I said, well, I'm sorry, you know, obviously it's outside, out of my hands now. There's not much I can do anymore, you know. Bearing in mind, I mean, we were going to do a double pulpotomy for 130 quid or something, which is, you know, I mean, as far as private dentistry goes, you don't really get a much better offer than that, unless you go to the community dental service or something where you get, you know, where they're all salaried and they don't don't have to earn a living. Oh, but you know, as soon as uh, as soon as uh, she's taking him to another dentist then that's it, isn't it, really? Because, I mean, I can't... If, if uh, a patient goes to another dentist and, you know, on the basis of the fact that they're not happy with uh, your treatment, then, uh, and rather than come back to you and say, I'm not happy with your treatment, you know, is, can you... Can you can you see him again and see if you could perhaps bring his pulpotomy forward or something? Because um, he's you know these people. Uh, but th this is what you find that uh, you know, and it can be anything really. It can be like I, I once had a, a, a appearance in front of a, a local disciplinary committee, what they call the Family Health Services Authority panel, because um, we took I took a wisdom tooth out of a woman, and um, she had a bit of bruising afterwards, and. We never heard, I never heard a thing, never heard a thing until uh, I was summoned before this committee to answer the fact that I'd been negligent in my extraction of this wisdom tooth because this woman had had uh, bruising and pain and needed painkillers later and uh, and, uh, and and she had not at any time con contacted me to tell me that if she was anything other than deliriously happy and so what do you do you know you can't be held accountable for some for a problem that you never even knew about you know we could have given her pain relief but it wasn't uh... anyway that's uh, still that still rankles even after 40 years that, that the injustice of that but you know if you uh, if you do something and the patient's in pain, or if they're in pain and you don't cure the pain immediately, then they might come back once and say, like, I'm still in pain. But the, 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 uh, the lesson is that they'll never come back twice. You know, if you can't cure it, then they'll look, look elsewhere for a cure. And as soon as they look elsewhere for a cure, basically what they're saying is, I don't think you're up to much. I'm not, you know, I'm not, I followed your advice for a couple of days. It didn't do what I wanted, didn't do the job. 
or it didn't work as quickly as I wanted, so I'm going to look for someone with a, else who might have a magic wand, you know. So that's that's fair enough, you know, which is a shame because it's not like she even she could even say, you know, can I bring him back to you to get the pole potteries done? Because I think at that point it just would have been too confusing. And I'm not I'm not against patients changing dentists. Honestly, I don't mind. Um, you know, I, I do agree. It's a patient's prerogative to seek treatment from whatever practitioner they want to seek treatment from. Um, but it's my prerogative not to re- uh, accept them back if they have um, if they've sought treatment in a way that shows me that they uh, had no confidence in my treatment planning or my skills. Um, because you can't work on a patient who's got no confidence in your treatment planning or your skills. That just won't work. You know, it's no use saying, uh, you know, I don't trust you. I don't think you're any good, but I'd like you to be my dentist. <laughs> that is not a recipe for success, is it? Um, but I know uh, which consumers association and all that. They'll say, oh no, you should shop around. You know, try and find a dentist who's, um, you know, who charges what you want to pay or uh, does what you want to do. You know, if you're a treatment planner. So. So, but that's a, that's a slightly different thing. That this we're talking about someone who's halfway through treatment, who decided to switch horses mid-race, and unfortunately swap from a thoroughbred to a donkey. But uh, and that's the decision that they're going to have to live with. So now the the, the child's got not had the extraction. I presume he's in. in a, I'm hoping the antibiotics will be working by now, and then the pain will have settled down a bit. And probably the second dentist will get all the credit for. Uh, uh, the fact that the pain went away. Uh, it's just one of those things, isn't it? You don't get a reward in earth. You get a reward in heaven. But, um, but what can you do? You're seven years old and you're surrounded by idiots. Nothing you can do. good thing is that uh, in many ways... Uh, unless your parents actually kill you. Not usually you grow up fairly well adjusted, but he's not gonna grow up with a lover dentist, I'll tell you that. Right, I've got a very busy, very busy Friday ahead of me today. I'm doing small line, I'm doing bridge fits, I'm doing new denture impressions. Normally I was supposed to finish at one o'clock on a Friday and I think we've had to fit two two or three people extra. I've got a bloke who, to be honest, he's a right mess. He's a well-known local businessman. And, uh, but phobic about the dentist. And so, only ever comes in for temporary fillings. Doesn't want injections. Because he's a... Uh, had um, drug problems in the past and uh, doesn't like being numb. He says the numbness is uh, weirds him out. So, I don't know. But the, it's always the way, isn't it? He's, he rang me and I said to him, I'm going to have a sticky on the end of the session. He's very unreliable. He quite frequently doesn't turn up and I've stuck him on the end of the session. It, that is just God having a laugh, that is. I said to him, don't be late. I said, because if you're like five minutes late, we're going out. And it's more than likely, he'll just ring up and say, no, I'm busy at work and and I can't make it, you know. But, oh, what are you going to do? These are the people that we are charged with sorting out. I tell you, I do, I do understand when dentists retire why they for the most part don't look back and while they love their patients to bits I'm more than happy to get shot of a lot of them as I think I will be well I will if they carry on giving me as much grief as they are at the moment I tell you fortunately uh, the majority of them are absolutely lovely okay here I am don't worry I'll download the footage 
I'll talk to you soon. All right, bye.